Okay. So the first thing we need to do is the food value between the whole wheat flour and the white flour. So I found this image that I think, um, okay, sorry, I, I was distracted by a phone. Um, this image from Harvard University shows very well the difference between the two uh, flowers. Okay, the whole wheat, let's start with that one, is the one that you see that has the brown uh, around it, the whole grain, and that section is the brown. Now the whole wheat retains everything we could say. Uh, it has the bran, it has the, the germ, and it also has the endosperm of the plant. That means that it retains most of the nutrition and it gives you more fiber. So the bran will give you the fiber that you need for your intestines to be clean and cleansed daily. So you have vitamins B and minerals with the bran. Then you have the endosperm, which is the larger white section, and that is the starchy, the carbohydrate in the plant. Yeah. It has some proteins and vitamins as well, but they are not the same as in the germ. The germ is a more fatty section, and it has is, is packed with nutrition like uh, vitamin E and other healthy fats. When we come to the refined grain, which is white flour, you can see in the image that all the brown, brown around it has been removed and you are losing the vitamins and minerals. And the germ, which is fatty, um, healthy fats, is also removed. And you are left only with proteins and vitamins. So you lost uh, vitamin E, you lost healthy fats, you lost the, uh, the phytochemicals, and you lost uh, your minerals. Therefore, the white flour normally is um, um, added. It has some vitamins and, and minerals added to it. And sometimes it's necessary to have white flour, especially if one person already has a medical condition and they cannot digest the bran uh, in, the, in the flour, then they might need to use the white flour and it's, it's okay, it has to, to happen. But also, if you are able to eat from now the whole grain, that is definitely the best option for you is healthier. So we, with the whole grain, we have more fiber. As I said before, it has a, helps you to have a clean in, intestine. And also in terms of diet, it has the full package, we could say. And it's also harder to eat. So you will be chewing more and that is better for your stomach. So you have a very good um, component there. So in food value, we could say that the whole wheat flour is the winner in nutrition. Yeah. And the white, the white wheat uh, flour is the poorer um, of the flours. However, there are occasions where we need to use it. Um, in terms of baking, the uh, white flour helps your cakes or your bread to come fluffier and softer. So you might need it for that type of baking as well. All right, so now let's describe the yeast. How do we use the, the, the how do we use the yeast? Okay, the yeast is a fungi, and there are several types of yeast, um, but the one used for the bread um, is very, very common. There is one used for the bread and also for uh, brewing a wine or alcohol, alcoholic beverage. But the yeast is a fungi that is single cell. It's only one cell, yeah? And, uh, and what happens with the yeast is that what it touches the sugars in the flour, or if you want to mix it with sugar, it would um, eat we could say the sugar, and it will convert it in dioxide, carbon dioxide, and ethanol. 
Now, when you bake your um, dough, the carbon dioxide raises even more of the bread and the ethanol evaporates. So you don't have any more of the alcohol in your bread. And I put a link there for you to look when you download these slides later, you can go to that YouTube um, and see how the yeast works. But that is basically the, the, what happens with the yeast and the baking. The yeast starts eating all the sugar of the whole, uh, the whole wheat flour or the sugar that you had to add to your recipe. Um, so let's go next. In the Old Testament and the New Testament, there are some examples where yeast is mentioned. So let's go to the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, you might remember Exodus. And yeast in, the, in Exodus is, uh, you can go and look on your Bibles, Exodus 12. Chapter 12, verses 39 and 30, 34 and 39. In there, God is telling the Israelites to prepare for leaving Egypt. And they, they are told to uh, uh, kill a lamb and have it for, for the evening. And they could have it in families. But then they, God also tells them, don't put yeast in the bread that you will have. Let me look for the Bible verse so that we can read it here completely. Exodus, in the rush to leave uh, um, Egypt, they couldn't <coughs> wait for all the yeast to rise, okay? So we go to verse 39, 12, 39, 34, and it says, so the people took their dough before it was leavened, having their kneading bowls bound up in their clothes on their shoulders. Yeah, that is the Exodus when they were leaving. And you can read the whole chapter so that you can um, read how the story goes in there. But then after, after that moment when they need to leave Egypt, then they start celebrating the Feast of the Unleavened Bread. And it's about this one, uh, when they had to escape from Egypt and they couldn't um, let, make the, the bread rise. And in the feast for seven days, they will remove all the yeast from their house, not only from the bread, but from the house. There couldn't be any trace of yeast. So that is one example, and it's from the Old Testament. Now, what about in the New Testament? In the New Testament, Jesus is the one who mentions the yeast. And we can go to Matthew 13, verses 33. Matthew 13. Please feel free to search on your Bible so that you can read together as I read it. Matthew 13, verse 33, and it says, the parable of the living. Another parable he spoke to them. The kingdom of heaven is like living, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till it was all living. And in Luke says also a similar uh, mention. And here Jesus is telling us that the kingdom of God is like living, so it rises and rises. And you remember that the yeast is a fungi that is only with one cell. And if you want, you can make a metaphor about you as a Christian, as a pathfinder, you a single individual, having the kingdom of God in you as a single cell, but you can go and share that kingdom with another person. And when we all as Christians and uh, we all as pathfinders, as stewards of God and missionaries, we touch each other's lives, then we can make the kingdom of God not only in your heart, not only in your life and your mind, but also in the lives of many more people. So that is what Jesus was trying to say here. To the 
And there is another funny episode that talks uh, about the yeast in the New Testament, and it's Jesus as well. This time, Jesus compares the Pharisees to the living. And we can find it in Matthew 16. Let's stay on that book of Matthew. You can go and check the other um, books, Mark and Luke, to hear more about it. But let's read Matthew 16, verses 6 to 12. The living of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Then Jesus said to them, Take heed and beware of the living of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And they, the disciples, reason among themselves, saying, it is because we have taken no bread. But Jesus, being aware of it, knowing what they were thinking, said to them, oh, you little faith, why do you reason among yourselves because you have brought no bread? Do you not yet understand or remember the five loaves of the 5,000 and how many baskets you took up? Remember the seven loaves of the 4,000 and how many large baskets you took up? In other words, Jesus is saying to the disciples, we're not talking about bread. Bread is not important. Have you forgotten all the examples when I had to give bread to 5,000 and then the other example when I had to give it to 4,000? So we're not talking about that bread. We're not talking about that yeast. How is it, verse 11, how is it you do not understand that I did not speak to you concerning bread? But to beware of the living of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Then they understood that he, Jesus, did not tell them to beware of the living of bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and Sadducees. So they understood this. So this is another example of mentioning yeast in the New Testament. And here Jesus is telling them, be careful with what the Pharisees and Sadducees are teaching. Because it's not according to what I want you to learn. Um, the Pharisees and Sadducees have really popped up too much. And um, they had many, many rules, and it was very difficult uh, to follow the rules, and it was a heavy burden for everyone. So here Jesus is saying, be careful, be careful uh, with what they are teaching in this doctrine. So these are the two examples in the Bible that talks about yeast. Let's move along to the next section. The first one of the breads is the whole grain bread. And this one can be with wheat, with rye, oatmeal, or any other grain. And for this, um, Ben Davison is going to talk about it uh, to all of us. So I pass it back to Ben. And please let me know if you want me to remove the slide or how you want to proceed. Thank you so much, Ben. Thank you. Uh, hi, I'm Ben. Um, I'm actually uh, Natalie's husband, so Natalie who works with Diane in the office, um, I'm her other half, um, and I'm going to talk to you about making uh, bread. So uh, if we could move to the next slide, bread in um, its basic form is just four main ingredients. Um, and before we go to the ingredients, the actual making of the bread itself is just a few simple steps. So as we got on the screen, we first of all mix the ingredients together. There is what's called kneading, and we'll go through that in a minute. Um, then we leave uh, the bread to rise and for the gluten to develop, and that's called proving. Um, and then we knock back shape, do a second prove to give it time to mature and for the flavors to develop, and then we bake. So if we go to the next slide, I'll tell you about the four basic ingredients of bread. First of all, we need strong bread flour. Now, um, strong bread flour means that it has a lot of gluten in it. And gluten is a protein within the flour which um, uh, is quite elastic, it's very stretchy, and it absorbs water. So as it absorbs the water and you work it um, and you give it some time, it becomes very stretchy. And because it becomes very stretchy and elastic, it's able to capture all of the carbon dioxide that is being developed by uh, the yeast that you put in. So the four basic ingredients, or indeed five basic ingredients if you include thyme, is the strong bread flour, salt for flavour, the yeast and the water. 
Now you can add lots of different uh, optional extras into there. So you can add multigrain, uh, you can have um, olive. If you'd like some olive bread, you can have chopped, uh, chopped olives in there. Um, uh, for us at home, I add uh, some olive oil into the dough. Uh, about 10% um, of the water content I will add um, uh, as olive oil because what olive oil uh, does is it actually softens the, uh, the bread, it softens the crust as well. And for those little ones who have got uh, milk teeth that are starting to get a bit wobbly um, and it's a bit uncomfortable to chew on some hard crust, it's a nice way of softening the bread and making it a little bit more palatable and a little bit easier. And butter will do the same thing, but uh, yeah, for those who like to keep off the dairy, then olive oil, and, and olive oil gives a nice flavor too, a bit of a peppery flavor. Um, or you can choose another type of oil is if, for example, you're wanting to add nuts to your bread, you could have like a walnut oil, for example, something along those lines. If we move to the next slide, we'll talk about mixing. So, um, you weigh out your flour. Um, in the uh, ingredients we had before, we had 500 grams. That's a nice uh, size loaf and should feed a family of five quite nicely for a couple of meals. Or if you're anything like our family, then it'll go in all one go. Um, and they'll eat it all with their soup and whatnot. Um, but a 500 gram loaf, you'll weigh out your 500 grams of flour. Um, you'll also have, I don't know if you can see this, um, fast acting yeast. Just one of those sachets will do for, for bread because it's not how quickly the bread uh, rises and how quickly you can make it. You can give it time to develop, you can give it time to grow. So you don't need to um, uh, speed up the process by act, uh, adding lots of yeast. Um, the, also the fast acting yeast, the good thing about that is um, it's dry, it's easily accessible, it's cheap. And it also comes pre-coated in a starter, which gets the yeast going as soon as you add it to water. So, or you add it to the, to the ingredients. Um, so uh, you don't need to add any extra sugar to the dough. There's plenty of sugar already um, in, in the carbohydrates within the, within the um, uh, flour itself. So you add the yeast and you add it to one side of the bowl. You add the salts to the other side, you need to keep them separate to begin with. Obviously when you mix they come together, but you need to keep them separate because contact directly between the yeast and the salt will uh, kill the yeast off, it'll retard it, it'll stop it from growing, it'll stop it from doing what it needs to do. So you then add the water into the dough mix, preferably on the side of the yeast, and give it a good mix together. When you first put the water in, it can look a little dry. Um, don't worry, give it a little bit of time, mix it around and all of a sudden it starts to get quite wet and if we move to the next slide you can see a couple of pictures of our two youngest and they're getting their fingers a little bit sticky and you can see that it starts to very quickly um, get quite sticky and a bit difficult to work with. Don't worry, what will happen is as you start to stretch it, as you start to work it, and it is a matter of stretching it out, folding it together and stretching out again, uh, and that's the process of kneading, is to actually start to work the gluten, start to distribute the yeast and the salt and uh, the water into the flour and mix it all together, you start to develop the gluten. And that gluten is absorbing the water, it starts to become more and more elastic. And the more elastic it becomes, the smoother the dough becomes. Um, and um, the better it is able to trap all of the carbon dioxide that's produced by the yeast. And if you move to the next picture, the next slide you'll see that it's getting a little bit stickier and then by the time it gets to the picture on the right hand side you can see it's looking a lot smoother it's looking a lot easier and as you can see from the table it started to pick up all of those sticky bits that are at the beginning were all separate and they're all starting to uh, they were all um, sticking themselves to the table as the gl uh, gluten starts to work as the kneading starts to get through after five or ten minutes it starts to pick up all of those little bits off the table and starts to come together as a nice smooth dough if you move now to the next slide, this next part um, is about proving. And proving is literally just waiting. It's just being patient. So what you'll see at the top is a 500 gram ball of dough that we have just kneaded. And at the bottom is that same 500 gram ball of dough that is more than doubled in size. Now, <clears throat> the um, fifth ingredient, as I said at the beginning, was time. And time is what you need to give for the uh, yeast to do its thing and for the dough to rise. However, it is also dependent on the temperature. Now, a really good temperature for proving dough is around 28 degrees, which is a little bit warm um, for most households. It's a little bit warm for most uh, kitchens. 
but what you will find is that even at a normal room temperature between 18 and 21 degrees in an hour and a half maybe two hours it's more than doubled its size it's bloomed it's gone up and it's become lovely and soft and fluffy and that's where we start to knock back that's where we need to take it out of the bowl and start to stretch it a little bit to develop that gluten even more if you move to the next page we will see that we're talking about knocking back and shaping but i've actually got an example here the example i've got here is actually white um, flour i don't have any wholemeal but wholemeal and white flour if it's strong flour has the same gluten content same type of gluten um, in it and so is actually comparable you can use the same ratios of 300 milliliters of water to 500 grams but I'm just going to show you here this is a little bit of in fact I'm going to move the camera down there we go so this has been um, rising for uh, about an hour and this is only about 150 grams and as you can see it's quite large and as as I start to stretch that out you can see how stretchy it's become and how slippery it's become. It's starting to stick a little bit to my fingers, but as soon as I dab it back, it comes off. So I'm just gonna show you just starting to stretch it and knocking back because all of these big bubbles need to be distributed into smaller bubbles. And I'm gonna see if I can get this done quickly on camera. I'm not sure how this is gonna work, but we're gonna have a go. There we go. So it's only a small dough. Can you see that at all? Yeah. There, is that better? Yes, we can. Right, so just a little bit of flour so it doesn't stick to my hands too much. Okay, and you just, as you can see, it's all soft now. And uh, I'm gonna start pushing it out. And you start just gently stretching it, a little bit like, I don't know if any of you were there for the pizza on there, but it's a little bit like the beginning of, uh, of the pizza where you're actually stretching the pizza dough out a little bit. It's quite similar. But what we'll then start to do is, I don't know if you can see, but there are little bubbles under there which we're just starting to knock out a little bit because we want to have a fairly even uh, uh, consistency to uh, the finished loaf. So we don't want to have big gaps. If you do want to have quite an open consistency, you can actually make dough with a lot more water. So you can add more, so you can go up to 350 milliliters or 400 milliliters, but it makes the dough a little bit more difficult to handle. Um, and it's a bit trickier to do, but it makes for much uh, more open consistency on the dough. So we then start to just stretch it out and then fold it in, stretch it out and fold it in. And this is developing that gluten even more and making even more stretchy. And we just keep on folding around just a couple more times, as you can see. And then we turn it over and we just squish it. And as we squish it round, we tuck our hands underneath and spin. And that's now starting to make a nice skin around the top and it's stretching that. And as that goes for its second prove, it starts to grow up and that helps to keep it all together and um, keep its form and its shape. So that's what you end up with. And if you're doing a 500 gram uh, uh, loaf, it'd be much bigger than that. Now you put that to one side, this time you don't need to put it in a bowl, you don't need to cover it up um, with, uh, with uh, cling film or anything. You can put that to one side and you can let that grow again for about another half an hour um, until it's pretty much doubled in size again. And that's the time when you bake it. But just before you bake it, what you do need to do is you'll need to score it. So you take a sharp knife. This is just an example, but you'll need to do um, uh, this with maybe a little bit of supervision. And you just need to score across the top like that. Maybe two, maybe three slices. What that allows you to do is that that allows, when it goes into the oven, there's going to be a, a spring effect. So all of those little bubbles of carbon dioxide in the bread, they're going to want to expand. And as it expands, the outside is already getting all crusty and hard. And so it may struggle to actually expand and it'll blow out the side or it'll start to tear or rip. By making cuts and shapes on the top, it gives the rest of the, 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 the bread and the dough room to expand and grow and so it still is able to keep a nice round shape. If you don't want a round shape, of course, you can start to be inventive at this point, and so you can stretch it out. You can maybe cut it into a few pieces. Um, you can plait it, you can do whatever you like with it. Be, be creative, be inventive. This is, this is the fun part of baking. This is the bit where you can start, I mean, I'm making a bit of a mess of it here, but um, if you can see maybe that you can start to create a little bit of a shape a little bit of a knot roll it in underneath and put it in the oven and see what happens this is the this is the fun part of actually making bread because at this point now this is the bit where you can actually shape it and do whatever you like to it if you want to add ingredients like the nuts like the olives like um, 
uh, little bits uh, like the herbs, for example, you can add it in at this point, mix it around, shape it, and then put it to one side ready to put in the oven. So, once this is all done, as you can see in the picture, that, there's your 500 gram loaf. That, um, and about half an hour later, this is what it should come out looking like. As you can see, the cuts that I made, the scores that um, were in the bread, they've expanded, they've grown out, they've given room for the, the dough to rise and uh, without actually exploding and being able to keep its shape. Um, if you uh, put it in an oven for about 200 to 220 degrees, it should only take about 30 to 35 minutes for a, a loaf of this size. And that's as simple as it gets. Now, there's a few questions before, before I go on, and uh, that is about um, other types of flour. It was mentioned at the beginning, we talk about rye flour um, or maybe oat, uh, oatmeal, things like that. These types of flour, they're very good for you, but they don't have gluten. And as you can see, the gluten is what makes it stretchy. It's, it's, it's the elastic part of the dough that helps to capture all of that, um, all of that uh, carbon dioxide that is produced. Now, I have here some dough that was made um, using 50% rye flour. So this is actually 50% rye. And rye doesn't, is very nice, but it doesn't have any gluten. As you can see, in, even in just approving, we've got tears. And if I start to pull that out, it's not stretchy. Can you see that? And it means that it's much, much more difficult to actually make a dough that is light and fluffy and airy. What you've actually ends up being is actually a little bit more dense, a little bit uh, more difficult to eat. It has a bit more flavor, but as a bread, it's more difficult. So this is why um, if I use rye flour, I tend to mix it around about a third uh, rye flour to a third wholemeal or a third white, depending on how you want to do it. And that will give you uh, enough stretchiness to still incorporate the rye flavor without um, compromising the actual type of dough and how you make the bread. Um, back over to you, unless there are any more questions. Thank you so much, Ben. It's so easy, isn't it? It, it, it may look uh, very straightforward. And uh, in that way, uh, Pathfinders, you get your ingredients, start mixing, follow the steps. You, you can download these slides and you will see it um, in practice. So have fun with that. Thank you so much, Ben, for uh, showing us this important step and being able to use it in life, you know? because there are so many more recipes that we need to go through. And, uh, and I'm gonna leave it just as a, here is the recipe, here are the photos, this is what happened. Uh, but obviously we will need more than one hour to explain every single process. This is fantastic that we managed to see the bread, which is the main one <laughs> in this uh, baking. Uh, okay, so let's go to the next section. You need to prepare two, two of the following. Yeast biscuits or unleavened bread or bread sticks or bagels or vegetable bread. So for this slides, we have done the unleavened bread and the bread sticks. So here we go. This is the recipe that we have for the bread sticks. And um, you need the flour, salt. In this case, uh, there is some uh, barley. And we also need the yeast, some uh, water. And also we have some durum with semolina. And you will see that it's used more for uh, the base of the dough when it's ready. So lovely. Didn't that come lovely? <laughs> Okay, so what happens first is with the bread sticks as well. Uh, parenthesis, you can use it by hands, you can mix it by hands, or you can use a mixer with a paddle attachment. So what we're going to do first with this one is that you're going to put some water into a small bowl and the fresh yeast. This recipe is for fresh yeast. Um, you can try with the dry one. Those are the two versions that we have. And here in the UK, sometimes it's easier to find the dry one. But you, you try. And then you will need to add the barley or the sugar and mix everything. And you will see in the, photo, in the image uh, on the top is all the yeast bubbling and starting to ferment with the um, sugar. And then you will have another bowl where you have the water and the salt. You need these two. And then what you're gonna do is that you're gonna place your flour 
and you're gonna mix them and you're gonna start working your dough and you notice that you have again a similar uh, bowl as Ben showed us for the bread but this time you need to put some oil on top and why we use the oil on this one is because it helps it to be more uh, sealed we can say and uh, give it uh, to grow but uh, when you put it to, to grow for the second time you need to expand it like a rectangle and when it's ready after uh, some uh, minutes probably an hour until it grows and doubles the size you need to get your knife and start cutting you see how uh, we have this image with a knife cutting it and it brings those little uh, strips of dough just leave it like that put it in your tray and you can seal it with some oil again we have put uh, the link of the youtube for that recipe that we followed and if you need to see step by step even more you can visit that uh, link on youtube and you need to bake it uh, at 200 degrees celsius for about 20 minutes so when it comes out uh, you can also actually be uh, you can also sprinkle some uh, seeds on it. Um, so that is for the um, breadsticks. Now what about the unleavened bread? This is uh, basically the bread that you use for communion. And you have your simple uh, ingredients, the flour, the oil, the water, and some salt, yeah? just to add some flavor. In fact, when you go camping, you can take this recipe for your bread for camp. And, <coughs> pardon. And, and here happens the same. You mix your ingredients, there is no yeast, so you don't wait for anything to uh, start working through and, and growing. So you just mix your ingredients, put a hole in the center of the flour, like making a fountain, and you uh, mix it all together. And as you can see in the image at the top uh, right hand side, you see that again in this recipe, uh, also a knife was used to cut through it, not because it needs to grow, but to make it easier when you break it. And it also looks nicer. Yes, so that is simple like that. And if you're in a rush and you don't have anything, any bread or anything, you can do, uh, you can bake quickly a uh, unleavened bread. Now, let's explain the use of baking powder and soda and why they should be avoided. Uh, and as well, why the mixture of milk, sugar, and eggs is harmful to health. Let's get into this topic. Baking soda is uh, said to harm our stomach and it causes some inflammation therefore when we use baking soda or uh, baking powder we need to be very careful which uh, quantities we use um, Ellen G White uh, when she wrote the books about temperance and um, ministry of healing she says this quote that you can see in your slide the use of soda or baking powder in bread making is harmful and unnecessary. Soda causes inflammation of the stomach and often poisons the entire system. And then he goes saying that many housewives think that they cannot make good bread without the soda, but this is an error. They, if they will take the time to learn better methods, their bread will be more wholesome and to a natural taste and more palatable. So, if we are told here that baking soda is um, harmful for you and inflames your stomach, so what is the alternative? Because you will see that, in, especially when it is in a patisserie, you are using a lot of uh, soda baking powder. But what is the alternative? Let's see. You can reduce the amount of your soda if um, by using other ingredients that will produce the acid acid effect of the um, of the baking powder so you can use with 
instead of one teaspoon of baking powder, you can use just one quarter of teaspoon of the baking soda. And you can mix it with, I put here four um, options. You can use it with plain yogurt, you can use it with cream tartar, you can use it with vinegar, or you can use it with lemon. And I have put there a website where I thought will give better uh, portions of the, the ingredients uh, so you can mix it. Have a go, try with them, and, and it should be healthier, yeah? And uh, then we have the topic of the sugar and the milk. In all the, I, I would say all of them, <laughs> but most of them, uh, of the recipes, sweet recipes for bread or cakes, we have sugar and milk together. And uh, Ellen G. White advised as well in the Ministry of Healing book, she says that far too much sugar is ordinarily used in food cakes, sweet puddings, pastries, jellies, jams, and all these are active uh, cause of indigestion. Um, especially harmful are the custards, the lovely custards, <laughs> and puddings, which milk, eggs, and sugar are the main ingredients. But then she carries on and says, the free use of milk and sugar taken together should be avoided. Notice that she says the free use. Yeah, we recognize that we should be able to have from now and then some cake, some pastries, but she says the free use of them should be avoided because these uh, ingredients together cause some fermenta fermentation in the stomach and then also can create some indigestion. In first place, Second, if we eat often all these sweet pastries, it's not healthy. It causes also inflammation in our brain. And, uh, and on top of that, we can develop diabetes, we can develop heart uh, disease, uh, heart problems, and your health then is being compromised and damaged. So there are some um, healthier alternatives to these ones. And in some of the recipes that we are showing you, you will see that we use the sugar, the milk, and the, the eggs. In others, we have um, less of these ingredients and a little bit more vegan as well. Here is what I was presenting, telling you before. So if we will have all these type of sugars <laughs> every day, <laughs> although they're very yummy, they will not be very good for our health. Therefore, bakers, pop finders, bakers, be very careful how you um, make all your recipes and they need to be healthy recipes and also the amount that we consume every day. So it needs to be nice treats. So here it is, all the things that can be developed, but the temperance is that we should avoid the things that are really harmful for our bodies and those who are good, that, that are good, we um, should take in a moderate um, a portion and as much as we can to produce them from, from scratch, not added sugars, not added fats, and especially not from the shops where the, everything has been done in an industrial way. So it's better if you and I learn to cook, to bake for our health. Okay, so those are the the healthy section in, in this uh, award. How do you test a cake for, that is being done? Okay, you probably know this uh, traditional method of uh, inserting into your um, cake once it's baked and the time has passed that you think mm, it should be done now. Well, you insert a toothstick in the, in the center and you check you put it in. When you take it out, you notice that if it is not done, you will see some of the uh, mixture in the tooth, tooth, uh, tooth uh, stick. If it is good, if it's done and cooked inside properly, the tooth stick will come out clean completely. And then you know it's done. So that's how you test your cake. Now, 
Um, perhaps some of you have already tried some cake baking and you notice that they sometimes sink in the middle. So what could be the problem? Here we have our cake. Uh, it could be that the temperature in the oven was not correct. It could be that it was too low and therefore it's taking um, too long for the bake and so it's making a, a different um, chemical reaction we could say or it could be too hot and so it's just shoom, growing but it's not cooking inside and when you remove it from the oven it will collapse it could uh, which is the next one un under baking the cake or also it could be that your baking powder was already expired or you put too much uh, or you didn't mix correctly uh, measure correctly your water your ingredients and uh, also the oven when you open it and close it i thought that my grandma would say these things just for the sake of saying them when when i was a kid but it actually impacts on the cake you need to open your uh, door of the oven slowly so there is no a sudden rush remember that all this in the kitchen is chemistry so the oxygen is really making an impact in there and also closing the oven uh, door slowly um then also could be that overbeating you will see in one of the recipes you really need to whisk a lot the eggs in this case eggs up. and if you overbeat your butter that it could make so much air come inside and then not cook properly and then it collapses those are the the the, the um, uh, possible suggestions of why it it falls okay so now let's see cake baking now we know about the the, the soda and the baking powder issues the eggs the sugar and uh, we need to prepare some cake so we have here you need to make two of any of this I'm sure Pathfinders, your parents are going to be so happy this coming weekend because you're going to be baking every single Friday, probably, or Saturday to have a special cake baked by you. Okay, so you need to make two. You can choose a simple cake, any flavor, vanilla, chocolate. You can make a cake from a cake mix already sold, yes. Um, you just need to add some extra ingredients in there or you can make a cake fruit or a sponge cake we made only one in this section and this is a sponge cake and here are the ingredients we use self-raising flour which is flour with some baking powder in it we use custard sugar and we use some butter we use three eggs we use salt and we use vanilla extract and the optional if you want some chocolate not the powder one pardon not the powder but the chocolate that you can melt um, in 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 your stove so here is what happened first uh, before you start with anything line your um, recipient with some baking uh, paper so it doesn't get stuck into the bottom if you don't have the, the baking um, paper, you can use plenty of um, butter or oil and flour, and then that will help you all around your, your recipient and the bottom, okay? And we're gonna mix, in this uh, cake, you mix your uh, butter with half of the sugar until it becomes creamy. It, it stops being a butter that you can spread, it becomes a cream. And then you put it aside. And then in another recipient, you're gonna um, sieve the flour and the salt, and you leave it there. And then on another recipient, you are going to uh, whip the whites of your eggs, the three eggs, just the whites, and these ones need to be, uh, let me move to the next one. You see the, the photo, the larger one uh, with, the, with the gloves, the hand with the gloves, the blue gloves. Those are the eggs that need to be uh, beaten. And you, it will be easier if you use a mixer, although you can use otherwise a fork and they start doing like this. 
and you're gonna be very, very tired, but you need to be consistent with your speed. Okay? But the point where you will stop is when you pour your um, recipient facing down and the egg will not fall, okay? Um, so once, once you have that ready, you can mix your uh, butter, your cream, your eggs, yes, and your uh, flour. And you can fold them all together slowly. Um, my husband said, from the bottom to the top. Yeah, I don't know if that really makes a difference. <laughs> it's just mix it. But he was very specific. Make sure that it's from the bottom, bottom to the top. And, uh, and you will have your mixture that then you can pour into the recipient as you see it in this picture here, um, middle in the right hand side uh, column. So that's what happens with the, um, with the sponge cake. And as we say here, this one is to, um, when, when, you, uh, when you start, before you start all your sponge cake, you need to put the oven at 180 uh, Celsius. And while you are preparing the things, the oven is warming up. But when you are ready to put the, the cake inside the oven, you need to reduce it at 170. It's a little bit lower and it will be 50 minutes, five zero minutes in the oven. And then you can test it with your, uh, tooth, uh, your tooth stick. All right, so that's the sponge cake. Now we're going, coming to the pie sections. Yes, make one pie in each of the following categories. You can make a baked, where you can bake everything, the, the base and the, the pie, or you can make another one where the only part baked is the base. Um, for the topping, you can use the fresh fruit, as you will see in one of our um, recipes, and also gelatin, for example. So let's start with this lemon pie. I took this recipe from the book Seven Secrets Cookbook by Niva and Jim Brackett. Um, I tested it, uh, it's one of my favorites, and I didn't have, their recipe calls for a uh, corn flour, but I didn't have corn flour, so instead of baking the top, I only baked the base, and for the top, I used gelatin with the um, orange, and with the um, pineapple juice and with the coconut milk. And I left them to cool. And you will see this one is absolutely easy because you take all the ingredients. Let me come to these ones. You have all the ingredients and you mix them and you make your uh, pie. And there is another one here, you say it's a, a crumbled nut crust. That recipe is also very easy because you will just mix all those ingredients for the crust and you will prepare your, um, um, your tray. You bake it just for 10 minutes, bring it out from the oven. And while it's waiting to cool down, you can then uh, blend all the ingredients of the lemon pie that is going to be the top. And in the case of my recipe, I just added the gelatin that we needed to warm it up. Yeah. But once that was, the gelatin was uh, dissolved, then we pour it in the, um, on, on the crust. And here you have the recipe for the crust, you can see later. I have a quick video here. My son helped me to do all the blending. Um, so I hope that it will be easy to see how um, practical this was and let's play this video.
you see now the piece of the pie, uh, then when, it, when the mixture was cool, it was already settled. So what, we just needed to put it in the fridge to be kept for the next day and we could eat it very nice and cold. And uh, something that I noticed here, you see that there are three colors. The top one is the one that has the coconut. The coconut with a high amount of oil, it separates from the juice and it leaves another color layer and then the crust. So that was the, sorry, sorry, sorry. No, I didn't want that. Yes. <laughs> so that was the, the no baked one. And now we have the fruit baked pie and also fruit cake. And we have the, rest, the ingredients here. Uh, five eggs, this one has lots of eggs and you will see how the, the crust comes because it's more like a bread, like a sponge that we need for this type of cakes. Hey, Paula. We need five eggs, yes? I managed to connect my wife, but maybe, oh, she, good. maybe she can say a few words. Fantastic, about. yes. So, uh, so uh, Diana, can you uh, unmute yourself and, and, uh, and, and take us through this recipe if possible? Thank you. Hello. Can you, can you hear me? Can you see me? Yes, yes. Yeah. Thank you, Diana. Hello, hi. Um, this was actually a fruit cake that um, my mother-in-law taught me for the first time. So um, I didn't really know how to do it. But as you said, this one has five eggs and yeah, five tablespoons of sugar and five tablespoons of flour. So that's the sponge part that is baked. Um, what is quite important, you showed it in one of the previous recipes, how you have to beat the eggs. So this is what we have to do in this one. So you have to beat the eggs and they kind of fluff up in a bowl. So that's it. So it has to, um, you beat the eggs with the sugar and then that's the end result. So when you see it in the, in the right hand side um, corner. And then you fold the five tablespoons of um, flour. Um, so you don't get the eggs to kind of fall down. So you just gently fold it in. Once that's done in the prepared dish, you pour it in and then you bake it for about 20 minutes on 180 degrees. And as you said, you can insert the toothpick or a skewer to see if the, the dough is done. In this case, it also starts to kind of move away from the edges and the edges of the, of the dough, they become golden brown. So you'll know that that's done, but it's basically about 20 minutes. And then we decided to kind of uh, make uh, this dough a bit hollow. So we took the middle bits and put it in a bowl and it looks like a little boat. And then we filled it with fruit. So the, the choice we used was we had, um, uh, we didn't have any fresh fruit with the lockdown, so we used the frozen fruit, but we normally have the fresh fruit about half a kilo for this one. And you mix it with the, the bit that you scraped out of your cake. And if you prefer it to be sweet, you can add a bit of sugar if you want to, but you don't have to, depending on your taste. In this particular one, we did use something that is kind of like custard. It was the vegan version but we didn't know how to call it, what is called in English, so we just put the custard. You don't have to use anything. You could put a little bit of um, cornstarch just to make it thicken the fruit, but you don't have to. Um, and then you just put the mixture on top of your cake and let it settle. You can decorate it. Yeah, I think there are some more pictures if you wish. Uh, or you can just cut it out and eat it like that. But, um, so this is what it looks like. Um, it would taste nicer if you leave it to sit for about two hours. So the sponge part of the cake soaks the soaks um, the fruit. And this yeah, is cake honor exactly. <laughs> so these are the options that you can choose for decorating. Yeah, thank you so much, Diana. It, it really oh, looks right. yummy. And <laughs> although it has plenty of eggs, I could say, mm -hmm. the amount of sugar is very, very minimum. It's just five uh, spoons. Some of the recipes call for 100 or 200 uh, grams. And so that is really a lot. Uh, and this one, you can serve it, as, as you said, and it's ready to enjoy. Um, now, thank you so much. Uh, we right. have the cookies if you are here please let's do that one at uh, first uh, the pot finders need to make and bake one recipe of cookies we have included two here 
the first one that I put there as a quick one is the lemon balls. You will see that it involves cashew nuts. So be very careful with the allergies on this one. And uh, lemon extract, salt and raisins and pineapple pieces, mix it. Follow these instructions, you put it in the fridge, you don't need to bake anything. It is so quickly, so, so quick and you have it ready. But now we have the baked ones. And I can just these ones, the peanut butter cookies. So these are the ones that I, when I started to uh, make things that are a bit more vegan now because we had lots of friends who are vegan so this is one of those that they approved and I thought maybe we could try this one yeah although it has a bit more sugar than I'd like so you can you can cut down on sugar but for this recipe I used it uh, to the tea so these ones are vegan and gluten-free because the flour that we use is actually oats so you can uh, buy oat flour but to be honest, I just grind my normal oats, rolled oats. So you um, start, uh, there should be um, a recipe, uh, there should be a picture with it, but basically you have the list of all the ingredients and you mix the wet ingredients separately from the dried ingredients. So you start with the peanut butter and then you put um, maple syrup and sugar in this one and coconut oil and flex eggs so that's why a flex egg there sh i should probably put a recipe what well, that is so that's two spoonfuls of flax seeds ground flax seeds with five tablespoons of water and then you mix it a little bit um, because you need something to keep the dough together so instead of using eggs we used flex eggs that's what it's called so all the wet ingredients you put together a little bit of um uh, vanilla extract and you have to they say whisk it ri rigor the, um, rigorously because you need to uh, get as much air in it as possible. I tried my hardest and it didn't go as um, solid as it was in the original recipe, but it didn't really make any difference. So once you've beat all the bits of the wet in, um, ingredients, then you put the baking powder, powder oat, um, oats flour, baking soda, and a little bit of salt, such as the pinch of salt. You combine it all together, then you just use whatever you want, a spoonful, a spoonful of each on a baking sheet. You bake them for about 10 to 11 minutes because you just make sure that they all get together because all of these ingredients you can basically eat raw. So you don't need to leave them in the oven more than 10 to 11 minutes. When they come out of the, um, the oven, they will be quite soft. So you have to let them sit on the baking tray for about a few minutes and then um, put them on a, on, a, on a tray to cool. And that's about that. Thank you so much, Diana. They really look yummy. And what I like of this recipe is that the eggs were replaced. So we're giving our pathfinders an option to replace eggs and what it is, as Diana said, is flax seeds. So ask your parents about flax seeds and you can mix it with water and you leave it there. I think Diana, um, round, green them, no, round them um, and then put some water. Yes. The only other thing is, I can just say you can have less sugar than in this recipe. Um, you can try the dough and see if you're happy with the, the amount of sugar because this is all edible um, even before it's baked so i would recommend less but in this one we had this much okay thank you so much thank you diana so these are the cookies and uh, these are <laughs> these are the links where you can find more aspects about this recipe of the vegan cookies um so now pathfinders all what is left to do is for you to get to the, your kitchen and every week prepare a different recipe according to what it is being asked in the an honor and file your recipes. When you give your uh, proof to your um, Pathfinder director or Pathfinder class at your church, then you can show them all the files that you have done and also your recipes. And if you want, you can also tell them when you have finished them so you can share with them part of your recipe as well. I mean, the actual product being baked. 
and enjoy it. Enjoy Pathfinders. See how many more recipes you can find using fruit and substitute the sugar by natural uh, sugar found in the fruit. So we can enjoy our desserts and our baking, but we need to now see how we can replace those things that are a little bit harmful for our body and also temperance pathfinders. That's what we all need to keep remembering. So enjoy your baking and uh, have a lovely, lovely week. Hola, thank you so much. Uh, and uh, thank you so much to everybody. Who, there are a few questions that came through. Um, uh, um, somebody asked a question about the, uh, the gelatin that you use. Uh, 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 vegetarian gelatin. Yes. Yes, I use the vegetarian one. Um, when, when you look, when you buy your uh, uh, gelatin, make sure that it's vegan, okay? There are some gelatin that you use uh, cow's uh, ingredients, uh, beef, it says, and there are others, mainly the easier to find is the one with pork in it. So make sure that you find the vegetarian one. Another, if the parents are here around and, uh, and you can be more familiar with this, there is also something called, um, oh my goodness, <laughs> it's an algae, um, agar. You can find agar, agar agar, and that is another type of gelatin and it's actually very, very strong. You just need one spoon and that's mainly what you need for your recipe, but obviously, um, the recipes might vary depending on how acid the fruit or the liquids are. So you might need a little bit more of that agar. But that agar is a uh, vegan, is uh, an, an algae. So yes, be very sh careful of what gelatin you you get. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, uh, dear part funders. Uh, 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 we're coming to the end. We would Thank like you. to say. Uh, we would like to say a big thank you to you, Paula. Thank you. I'm just stop thank you. your screen. Thank you very much. Thank you. Let's just, let's just, let's just a big thank clap you. to everybody. Paula, yeah. thank, yeah. thank you. So I'm much. so glad that Ben and Dayan thank managed you. to come through. Thank because you. it's a lot thank of you, Paula, thank, you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for the